Welcome to the Living After Faith Podcast, a podcast designed to help you as you leave religion and move forward with your life. We are the official podcast of RecoveringReligionists.com, a recovery group founded by Dr. Daryl Ray, the author of The God Virus. We welcome your feedback. You can contact us by going to LivingAfterFaith.com at Facebook.com slash LivingAfterFaith and follow us on Twitter at LAF with me. And now here's today's program on Living After Faith with Rich and Deanna Joy Lyons. And today's guest is Jerry Williams on the Living After Faith podcast. Thanks for joining us, Jerry. Thanks for having me. Jerry, I came across your uh, material on YouTube and was very impressed with it. So before we get into the background and how you became who you are, let's talk about what you're doing on YouTube and the different slant that you take as far as uh, skeptical and atheist thought. My take is... I have a tremendous focus on critical thinking skills. A lot of times, especially when it comes to skeptics and dealing with uh, atheism, they tend to argue the facts with with believers, which elevates them to a certain amount of equality, as far as I'm concerned, and I don't think they have that. Oftentimes, the best way for me is to just look at the very statements they're saying and showing how that they're false in amongst themselves. Let's not argue the facts. Your very your statements themselves don't hold up under their own weight. So instead of arguing biblical scripture, what I like to do is um, argue the critical thinking that uh, process that went on and take it apart from there, and not even get any further into the subject. A perfect example of that was your uh, discussion of the quote atheist riddle. Right. I hated that thing. <laughs> but you handled it so beautifully. <laughs> well, one thing about the atheist riddle is if and if you go online, you'll see a lot of people. The atheist riddle, if your listeners are familiar with it, is a, a three statement so-called riddle that posits that uh, the human DNA is a code and as one statement. And second is that all codes that we know of um, are made by intelligence. And then the third statement is that since we know that as a fact, then DNA must have come from intelligence and thus God exists. And there are a ton of people going through how the definition of code is changed and this is what computers actually do and trying to show that DNA is not a code and, and breaking all that down and they, they don't look at the fundamental aspect that the three statements in them of themselves don't make sense. And so I don't even go into the to disputing the facts of of the details of the riddle just that a plus b does not equal c in the sentence that in the in the equation they put out and thus i don't even need to go any further with the conversation exactly and it's really not a riddle it's actually a syllogism yes uh, so it's kind of an anomaly that they would call it a riddle to begin with so let's go back and let's talk about uh you also were born in texas and uh, exposed to all kinds of loveliness there i suppose yes we um i was yeah i was born in texas uh was start we started off baptist and then um when my father got out of the military we moved to des moines iowa which was not that much of a change when it came to religious influence uh, but uh, through the 70s, my my parents got hooked up with uh, what was remaining of the Black Panther Party, so we converted to uh, uh, black Muslims. So I, so I had that going on. And then uh, after that, um, my mother, through her mother, converted to Jehovah's Witness, and so then I had, had that. And um, so it was an interesting little cycle of religiosity there, And uh, but I'm actually quite glad that I went through it because I could you – know, I was able to compare – things you know i was able to see things from different angles and i think that's helped me a lot over the years you know some of the and i don't know your particular brand of baptist some brands of baptist can be pretty extreme some brands of muslim can be pretty extreme jehovah witness by pretty much definition is fairly extreme so you've seen three pretty different uh, well widely different forms of extremism yeah and now the Baptists, I don't remember as much because I was that was like my first religion. That was just the way things were, and you know, a lot of those memories are gone. Uh, but the black Muslim stuff, I remember a lot of, and that was very 70s, very anti establishment, very uh, militant uh, black Muslims. It was very much uh, preparing for the race war type of stuff that we did. 
which was uh, which was interesting. <laughs> I have to say, when I look back, I go, "Wow, I really went through all that stuff. I really had to learn martial arts and uh, and prepare." And we um, we almost took a trip to Libya to learn all sorts of things with a little youth group. Uh, luckily, that fell through. But uh, and then uh, with Jehovah's Witnesses, the Jehovah's Witnesses actually, I found they they have an extreme view of things, but they're so removed from society. Uh, my foot, my parents are still Jehovah's Witnesses, and they don't engage in politics. They don't engage in you know any type of celebration. So even though they have kind of extreme views, they really restrict it to themselves. So that's never been that big of a problem. I'm going to go a little off topic here, but it's it's where things are here. You mentioned uh, the black movement, and from East Texas, that is one of the things that I love so much about leaving that area. It is the most racist area, and I'm sure you encountered that in Texas, so uh, a little different from where we normally go on our podcast, but let's talk about racism and how... Uh, do you find that in the South, number one, it's more? And number two, do you find that religion tends to push that to another level where I think people who uh, are kind of removed from religion are also able to remove themselves from the racist thought? Yeah, well, I can't speak as much to the, the South itself since I was so young there. Most of my religion was in the uh, the Midwest. But for me, the Midwest was really quite racist. And religiously, it was very segregated. I, someone said once the most segregated day of the week is Sunday, you know, and that was very much true. You, you know, white people went to their church, black people went to their church or, or mosque. And, and it was in the mosque uh, for me that all the racism that I never heard on a daily basis came out. That's when it's like, well, wait a minute, you're talking about white people like I've never heard you talk like this before. Why are we talking about this here? And so, yeah, religion pr provided uh, an asylum for racism, I think. I know when I was pastoring in Marshall, Texas, and a little bit of background about the city. If you walk around the square of that city, you'll see monuments to the Confederate soldier. Uh, one particular general who was from Marshall is honored on a plaque there, and his job was to organize slave labor to build forts and roads for the Confederate Army. <laughs> 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 what an ironic concept, and, and the fact that it's 2011, and this monument honoring this guy is still there. I mean, it, it's it, still there. Yeah, my wife and I visited. I took her down to uh, see my hometown for the first time. We've just celebrated our first anniversary. So we go there, and in just two days, she said, I have seen more racism and homophobia here than I have in my entire life in Seattle. I mean, it, that's <laughs> the city, and... While we were talking with uh, a friend of ours recommending a restaurant, she said, they, I hear they have great food there, but you probably don't want to eat there because that's where the black people go. <laughs> <laughs> this is 2011. So imagine, you know, 11 years uh, ago, back in uh, early 2000, I tried something unique in, in trying to, uh, there was another Pentecostal church there that was the black Pentecostal church, and there was us, we're the white Pentecostal church, <laughs> and we tried to get together and have some services together. There were a few people in my congregation who got that, but not very many, and overall, it just started more shit that I ever imagined <laughs> could be started over something just so simple. And uh, I mean, just the idea that uh, we're all God's children, we should worship together. And I, I found out that we're all God's children may mean one thing in the Bible, but in reality, it means something different. Right. Yeah. That's the one of my problems with religion. They like it allows uh, for you to have these blind, you know, blind spots uh, in your in your vision and it kind of fills it with, <laughs> with, with God or whatever, and um, it, it gives it gives them a haven for this this type of stuff. And um, I think it's it's destructive to things like critical thinking and open mindedness and and reaching out. It's uh, it's quite frustrating to me. What was the process that led you from uh, Baptist, from Black Muslim, uh, Jehovah Witness that led you out of all of that and into the place that you are now? When people hear that I became an atheist at seventeen, they out, they automatically say, "Oh, well, he's rebelling against his parents." And the fact is, I wasn't rebelling against my parents. I get along with my parents great to this day. We talk religion all the time. We have great conversations about it. But um, for me, it's a very a more odd story. It comes from the one from the fact that 
we were black Muslims and were very anti-authoritarian. And I, that was a lot, one thing that was expressed to me a lot from my mother, which was always question authority. But of course, her idea that the, was the authority would be the white man. And so I took the always question authority thing to heart, you know, very much. At the same time, I was also a big comic book fan. And so around 12 or 13, I was a huge Thor comic book fan. And so much so that I would go to the library and read more stories about Thor. And was going to the library, reading all these stories, that I learned that this, this guy Thor was a genuine god. He was worshipped by people for generations. This was not mythology at one point. It was a genuine religion. But now it's mythology. It's fairy tale. And these are things that we kind of we kind of laugh at. But the more I read about it and I started going into uh, Norse, um, more Norse mythology, more Roman mythology, I started seeing that all these themes were very much the same. And I started thinking, why is this stuff mythology and the stuff I'm learning in church not? And at that point, probably very soon after that, I very quickly became an agnostic. I was like, OK, wait a minute. How do I know what I'm saying is true? What I'm believing is true. It's this could be a myth in 20 years, as far as I know. So that put that first step. From there, my growing curiosity about science, math, um, just things like geometry, just logic and critical thinking, uh, pushed me to just slowly, subtly. By the time I was 17, I was like, I'm an atheist. Now, I couldn't really speak out about atheism much because I was still living at my mother's house. I was made to go to church uh, every week if she went until I was 18 years old. I was told you were going to go until you were until you were at least 18. On my 18th birthday, I said, OK, I'm not going anymore. What was the backlash or was there any? There was a little mostly because as the firstborn son, as, as the like the uh, male role model to everyone else there was a tremendous amount of disappointment from from my mother it was like a certain amount of rejection that she she felt uh but since we had such a good relationship um she would just basically try to constantly convert me and i would you know thwart her <laughs> and it just it went on from there most of the the backlash i got uh serious backlash was from the black community there's just the concept of being black and atheist is they're, they don't even go together. They just, it's just one of those things that we don't hear about. Uh, the black church and religion has such a great, oh, a tremendous uh, part of black history in America that it's considered, you know, literal sacrilege to say that it's not something that should be a part of our lives. I find that to be kind of strange because you look at Frederick Douglass, uh, an atheist. Uh, I love a lot of uh, reading the things he said, how, you know, if slavery was God's way of doing things, then he couldn't believe in that God. He said, I prayed for my freedom for 20 years until I prayed with my legs and finally found it. I mean, he was instrumental in changing the world as we know it and did that through atheism. And yet still there's this uh, powerful grip on the black community from religion. Yes, one of religion's greatest flaws or the biggest problem I have with religion is that it diminishes critical thinking. It it makes that part of us uh, atrophy because it, it allows us, uh, it just forgives uh, things so easily through faith. And things like history just aren't, aren't taught. They're just glossed over as things that have you know uh were a, a glitch uh, a, a little spark but it's not true that's just that person's experience uh it doesn't need to translate uh, over to to the rest of us so yeah uh i don't understand it it's too i think it's just so ingrained in black society uh since it was so helpful to well it is considered to have been so helpful in keeping the family unit together the best they could uh during those troubling times that it's uh it's almost genetic <laughs> i think also religion uh was used to keep slaves uh, content if if that word can be used uh, right content as slaves and and what a horrific thing uh to pay homage to today uh oh of course yeah yeah it's it's it completely it, it, it doesn't make any sense whatsoever but again <laughs> That's what religion does. It allows you to have these completely contrary things live in your brain at the same time and 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 move forward with it. 
Now that you're focusing on critical thought, you're putting a lot of good material out there. What kind of response are you getting uh, uh, from the community in general, but uh, but also from the black community? From the black community, I'm, I'm getting a lot of, okay, you got to go after the, you know, find out about the Illuminati. There's a lot of, there's a lot of conspiracy theory uh, in the black community. It's, and it's for a reason. There have been tremendous amount of conspiracies against the black people over the years. So black people were very uh, prone uh, to conspiratorial thinking. And so what I get is I get a lot of uh, requests that I prove conspiracy theories to be true, uh, which tells me that they really aren't understanding what I, I'm what I'm saying. But people think that their process is critical thinking. They always believe that what they are doing is critical thinking. Oftentimes they're just being cynical. Oftentimes they're just reaffirming their own prejudices. But they believe that they're being uh, they're being critical thinkers. So one thing I'm having to do is sift through uh, the different ideas that are being uh, pitched to me and find out where the thinking process is going. And that's that's why things take a while for me is that I need to find out what the threat is. Where is their thinking going wrong other than just the fact that their facts are wrong? Try to find out where their thinking is going wrong that led them down that path. And uh, so I'm, I'm going to deal with some 9-11 conspiracy stuff coming up. Uh, I always have to go back to, to religion because uh, that's just a core thing for me. But I'm getting a lot of good feedback. There's a lot of people out there who agree with me, with uh, free thinkers like like yourself, that um, don't know how to voice it and are happy to see that someone is uh, doing these things. And so I'm getting a lot of encouragement that way. And so I'm just going to move forward with that. You know, one of the things that I've enjoyed so much in your material, there are so many people out there who are disputing the facts and, and they're far better at that than I could ever do. There are so many people out there who are focused on that. But what I really enjoy about what you do is you're very willing at times to say, okay, forget the facts. Let's look at the fact that your thinking is wrong. Right. That's my point a lot of times. Sometimes um, if, you, if you get, I hate to say the phrase, but bogged down in the facts, that allows them to keep the conversation going. It gives them equal footing with you to say, well, that's what your expert says, but my expert says this. Well, that your expert once said these words, and so they can kind of go back and forth and keep the, the balls flying up in the air, when oftentimes the basic premise just doesn't hold up if you look at the words as they're said. And so that's where I try to go. I try to look at the statements as they are said and see if they hold up on their own. And if they don't, let them know we don't need to go forward with this conversation because you are not making sense on the face of it. So my videos tend to be short because there you go. I'm just showing you where they're, they're logically flawed and now I'm done. One of the best things that happened to me is when someone explained to me, they said, you're using circular logic. And I gave them, I'm sure, the deer in the headlight look. And they explained to me what circular logic was. Mm -hmm. And I'm not the best at explaining these kind of things, but I've gotten to where I can recognize it in myself. And once I recognize, wait a minute, this is circular. I'm starting with the idea and just confirming my own idea here. Let me right. step out of my idea and actually think about this. It's amazing how much once you can recognize simple errors like that, that, you know, uh, the Bible's true because the Bible says it's true, for instance. Right. You know, God exists because it says he exists. You know, once you get to the point that you can get outside of th circular logic, or at least for me, uh, and then begin the critical thought process of, you know, how the logic actually lays out, it, it be kind of becomes obvious on a lot of things mm -hmm. that they're not the way we thought they were. Right. And conversations get short, get cut short very quickly uh, for me when someone disputes something I, that I think and they say, well, the Bible says, says, says and I say, the Bible isn't a valid piece of evidence when you come to proving the existence of God. Because it's circular. And say, well, then the, you're, are you going to use the Bible for this next reference? Well, I, and then they can't go anywhere. It's like, okay, we're done. I had a recent conversation that went hundreds of comments in a, in a thread. And I kept saying to them, you know, I'm not going to show you what's on the toilet paper I flushed today if you won't tell me what's in the Bible, because I don't think one is any more important than the other. You know, to me, we can prove that there's so much error in the Bible that, uh, and it says there is none in itself. So it in itself 
is wrong. Okay, right. It just is inaccurate. We we know that. So I can't let you use that as a basis for argument. Let's discuss logic and thought and let's let's work through this and it's amazing how once you take away that weapon either your adversary goes away write you off as a heretic or just they can't hold a conversation just based on logic and thought right i recently had a several hundred uh line conversation on on twitter which is weird having those long conversations on twitter but this person was trying to uh, discuss with me my atheism and his entire tactic was to try to put the the burden of proof on me that uh to prove that that god did not exist and and right off the bat i tried to explain to him that for me the existence of you know the non-existence of god is a, is a starting point if you want to tell me god exists you then need to start bringing forth evidence and so the most of the conversation was him trying to flip the the tables to make me have to have the burden of proof and once he got the idea that I was not going to allow him to shift the burden of proof to me, it then denigrated into, you know, talks about my manhood, <laughs> you know, <laughs> name calling, you know, name calling, uh, telling me to, you know, to, you know, to grow a pair and just take a stand. It's like, I have taken a stand. My stand is you have no evidence. And once when they're confronted with the fact that they have the burden of proof, if they want to convert me, uh, it usually you know falls apart pretty quickly. One of the arguments I used to use, and when I look back at it, I think, stupid old me, stupid old me, I is, you know, I would say, well, you can't, and the uh, same as the O'Reilly thing, God, I'm in the same boat with O'Reilly, is you can't explain where this came from, or you can't explain, and now the simple thought is, you know, just because I don't know where something comes from doesn't mean God made it, it just means I don't understand where something comes from. Right, it's the, the classic kind of God of the gaps that God explains the things which we don't know. And that that works for some people. But when I point out to them that with that logic, God has gotten smaller and smaller and smaller over the years because it used to be God explained everything. And then every time we just dis- we discover something and learn something scientifically, then we say, okay, that's all science. But okay, this part, we don't know that that's God. And then we learn something else and they say, okay, that's all perfect and scientific. But this part we don't know is that's God. And that's getting smaller and smaller and smaller, but they still want to use that to, to, to fill that gap. God just fills that gap. And when someone who claims that there's scientific proof of, of God and uses this type of reasoning, I have to tell them what they are saying is anti-scientific, that that since we don't know something, we never will know anything. We are going to be limited uh, in our discovery over the years, and thus we're going to fill it in with God. And when they see that, they usually just bail out of the conversation. Exactly. There's nowhere really for them to go. Speaking of which, what do you see? You're on the front lines of... Uh, uh, educating of of enlightening people to a different way of thinking what do you see do you think we'll see maybe not in our lifetimes but do you think humanity will ever shake free from religion as uh, a part of its existence as a part of its existence probably not but as a dominant force the way it is you know i'm i'm really hoping so i think over time it religion will diminish in its influence but it will always be there because there's always always going to be people who don't have their own moral compass and need these kind of guide rails. And that's one thing, if there's anything positive I can say about religion is it does provide some guide rails for people who do not have their own moral compass. Other of us who I would like to say are ethically mature people have the ability to um, make decisions without uh, the threat of punishment or the possibility of reward, we can do it you know, through our own uh, volition, but some people don't have that in them. And there will always be a place in society for religion for those people. But as people like yourself, myself, I have a six-year-old son, and that's probably what really pushed me onto this front line is the fact that my child is just now getting into the education system. And I I really, really want to make sure that uh, the religious influence is taken out of his uh, experience in school and critical thinking is put in more. But as people like us raise children, with critical thinking and free thinking ideas, their influence will increase and that of religion will decrease. 
Yeah, I noticed that they're now saying up to 16% of Americans uh, are non-religious people, either uh, atheist or agnostic, or list, list none as their religion. And the I don't have the study right in front of me, but a the younger demographic, and I don't remember the age that it cuts off, that was over 25% among right. those who are younger. So obviously, atheism is growing in the younger minds, and I think that speaks well for the direction. Yeah, and I think one thing is that the younger people have a broader range of experience. They see people of other religions and other thoughts, and once when you see that another person of another religion or another upbringing can be as morally good and ethically correct as you can and, and be on the same level, you you stop feeling the requirement for there to be a difference you know, between you. And once you start doing that, the need for religion goes away. And so we're getting an increased amount of you know young people uh, who have uh, these free thinking ideas. So it comes with religion. It comes with um, uh, civil liberties. You know, the generation of of people who were so homophobic they're 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 dying off. They're going away. And this new generation that's coming up doesn't even understand the concept of homophobia as much because it just doesn't make sense to them. And so, you know, there's a generation of these, you know, open-minded, civil liberty, you know, loving children and free thinking children that are coming up and hate to say it, the other ones are just going to die off and the religions are going to go with them. You know, it reminds me a lot seeing where we are now watching as I was growing up when I was in second grade, uh, there was a court order that required the school system to desegregate. Now, this would have been uh, the same year that man landed on the moon. Mm -hmm. We're just in East Texas, finally, you know, worked through the court system that we have to do what everyone else did a decade or so before <laughs> okay, right, right. and, and uh, you know, desegregate our schools. So I had to go to a different school. And I remember the things people told us and there I am, you know, young, I think it happened. Uh, the third grade was the year I actually had to go to a different school, but uh, all the decision, everything happened in the second grade. And I remember people saying things like, you know, uh, just so much stuff that we learned was bullshit. I mean, my third grade teacher was a black woman and uh, Miss Edmonds, delightful lady. Uh, I was so terrified and she was just the sweetest human possible and right. a lovely person and dispelled so much of the shit that I was told just by being who she is, mm -hmm. you know, just by being a person. And we grew up in our, our area, uh, black kids, white kids in the same classroom. And we kind of learned something, you know, the kids who study a lot, make good grades. The ones of us who are lazy, which is me don't make good <laughs> grades. You know, the kids who work hard on the football field are great football players. And the slackers like me, well, <laughs> you're not a great football player, you know, and right. we just kind of learned uh, that whole thing. And, uh, there was a, the traditional place of desegregation was high school where everybody went to one high school and that was where all the racial issues and tension showed up. But among my classmates, we had been desegregated well before that. Mm -hmm. And uh, when we got into high school and people began talking all this trash and stuff, we said, you know, we're past that. We, we, right. We've already worked through our deal here. And that doesn't mean that we didn't have, you know, there were people who, uh, I think we had realized racism was a bunch of bullshit, but I don't think that we had uh, a lot of us fully come to the place where uh, we could necessarily shake it from our roots, so to speak. Mm -hmm. And I think maybe that's the direction we're heading uh, with religion now. A lot of people are saying it's bullshit, and we're in the process of trying to shake it free from who we are. And I think that's a great example of, of where we're going to go when it comes to uh, acceptance of, of atheism in society, because it, it wasn't that long ago. I was doing some volunteer time with with teenagers and and things, and one of the, one of the young women there asked me what church I went to, and I said I don't go to church, and she said why, and I said because I'm an atheist, and she said what does that mean? Right off the bat, that stunned me, but I explained to her that it means I don't believe in God, and she she, she you know she was a young black girl, her face went pale and her eyes widened, and she ran away from me. It's because wow. she had never experienced the concept of, you know, an atheist or if she had the a person who doesn't believe in God is a bad person. But as more of us come out of the closet, as more of us present ourselves and show that um, uh, you know, be our role models to people and show that we can be more. We are moral people. We are just as moral in, as anybody else on the planet, if not more so in some cases, they 
will be converted just as the old time conversion was. It's like, oh, someone would say, why are you doing this for me? Is it for this reason? Do you believe in God? And I say, no. And they, they say, how can you be this way and not believe in God? And as they, you know, as we talk, they can understand that, oh, I don't need to have this structure to tell me uh, to be good. It's completely possible. It's completely acceptable to not believe in God and still be a good person. And it becomes more acceptable in society. And that's what's just going to happen over the year. Our guest today is Jerry Williams. Jerry, tell us where we can find your information on YouTube, Twitter. Tell us how we can uh, wrap our brain around uh, the thoughts that Jerry Williams has. On YouTube, Twitter, and Facebook, I am Greater Sapien. One word, uh, greater, spelled as it is, and sapien as in homo sapiens. Um, So YouTube.com slash Greater Sapien. Twitter.com slash Greater Sapien and Facebook slash Greater Sapien. Anything else? Um, let's see. If you, if any of your listeners have any suggestions, uh, any stories about uh, arguments that they've heard uh, for religion uh, or against atheism that you are curious as to what's wrong with it or you can feel that there's um, uh, a logical flaw that you can't necessarily identify, um, Please let me know. I, I'm I'm constantly looking for uh, deconstructing the thought processes of uh, of believers, and that's astrology, magic, um, any type of magical thinking, which is my basic category for this type of thing. Uh, conspiracy theories, uh, send it to me, and uh, I'll see what I can do about it, and maybe we can deconstruct it uh, for everyone. Jerry, I have so much enjoyed this conversation. Thanks for oh, this joining is great. us. No, thank you for having me on. Thank you for listening to the Living After Faith podcast with Rich and Deanna Joy Lyons. Living After Faith is a podcast designed to help you as you leave religion and move forward with your life. We are the official podcast of RecoveringReligionists.com, a recovery group founded by Dr. Daryl Ray, the author of The God Virus. The music for this show is provided by Morrison's Prophecy. See LivingAfterFaith.com for a link to more music from Morrison's Prophecy. We welcome your feedback and you can find phone numbers and email addresses at Living After Faith faith.com at facebook.com slash living after faith and follow us on twitter at laf with me